Hi, and welcome to a discussion on the status of women in the USSR. The status of women changed a lot in the Soviet Union in the uh, 20s and 30s, and one of the main reasons was simply because the Bolsheviks were revolutionaries. They were trying to completely change society, and to do that, you, uh, you tear down its pillars, and one of those pillars was the traditional Russian family. So that was one of the things that the Bolsheviks went after. Um, in, a, in a kind of more particularly Marxist sense, Lenin and other Bolsheviks saw the household almost as a microcosm, uh, as a microcosm of, the, um, of the kind of oppressor-oppressee relationship that was happening in society as a whole between the, um, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. Um, women were exploited for their household labor. They were not paid. They were uh, um, oppressed uh, socially, sexually, economically. Take your pick. Um, so for Lenin, this was a very important thing, getting rid of these traditional roles that, uh, that oppressed women. Um, and the way Lenin proposed to do this was, by, was largely by expanding state support for, uh, for institutions that would free women from the obligations that they'd traditionally been encumbered by. So things like easier access to, to laundries, to canteens, so food and clothing wouldn't be so much of an issue. Things like um, maternity leave, um, uh, care for pregnant women, uh, care for nursing mothers, uh, health care, um, all these things that dominated the lives of women in Soviet Russia, um, or in, in the Russian Empire. Um, children's child care, uh, nurseries, kindergarten, and so on were very, very important for liberating women from their role in the home, in the house, and allowing them to have an independent economic life. Now, others went farther. Alexander Kolontai, a very interesting early Bolshevik, who was, uh, she was the leader of basically women's issues and uh, called the women question, as the Bolsheviks would say, um, on women's issues and a lot of social issues during this time period. Um, she's also one of the, basically the only old Bolshevik, the, one of the original Bolsheviks who dies of old age. Uh, she, makes it, uh, she makes it through the purges, she makes it through uh, the Great Terror, she makes it through World War II. Um, she's, uh, she ends up basically falling out of favor with Lenin and in the 1920s, she's sent overseas and spends, you know, the, the middle part of her life as, um, as an ambassador to Sweden and Finland. So she got out at exactly the right time. Good job, Alexander. Anyway, um, she, was, she was more radical um, in terms of social issues and in terms of gender relations than Lenin was. Um, she pushed the Bolsheviks and succeeded in pushing the Bolsheviks to revolutionize gender relations and marriage um, because you know marriage was uh, it was not just the economic um, it was not just I guess the economic structure of the household that oppressed women um, and in Colin Ty's eyes it was also the institution itself um, so it was changed in many ways um, for the benefit of women um, under as Colin Ty was pushing this policy anyway. Um, con uh, contraception and abortion became legal and free so that women would not be, um, as Colin Ty saw it, in encumbered by the demands of, of children they might be forced to have um, or that men would go off and leave them with. Marriage was taken away, taken out of the religious sphere. Um, divorce was granted upon request which was definitely not the case in, uh, in Tsarist Russia with uh, the, the influence of the Orthodox Church being so great. And this had, a lot of, this had a lot of effects on gender roles and the life of women. Um, not all of them exactly what, was, uh, what the Bolsheviks were shooting for. Um, the USSR, the, the divorce rate shot up in the USSR. Um, it became the highest in Europe, 25 times that in Britain. Um, and most of these divorces were initiated by men. Um, frequently when the woman became pregnant, men would often uh, serially, one after the other, marry, uh, maybe impregnate, and then divorce women some uh, 15 times or more. There were you know, a lot of cases of this. And so it turns out that 
the policies that Colin Tai sought did not necessarily um, take society to the place that she wanted. She the policies also had uh, an important effect that the, uh, the leadership was not happy about, which was a major drop in the birth rate uh, due to the increased avail availability of abortions. Um, by you know a decade after the, the Bolsheviks were consolidating their power, um, the abortion rate in some places was almost three times as much as the birth rate. So, you know, you're obviously going to have a population problem if that's your case. In, in other terms, um, women saw some advances due to, uh, due to these policies. Um, there, was, um, there was increasing equality in education. There was official equality in the workplace for women. Um, but at the same time, this was, you know, the, the letter of the law is not always the reality of the law. Um, the jobs that women got during World War I and the Civil War, while men were gone, very often uh, they would lose once men came back from the front. Those men who did come back from the front, there, you know, quite a lot of them did not, um, in part because um, 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 owners or managers saw women as actually more expensive workers than men because of the time off they might take for, for pregnancy, for birth, for raising children, and that kind of thing even though they weren't paying women as much as they were paying men. Um, so not, definitely not the best of all possible worlds uh, for women after the war, after the, uh, the end of the Civil War. There was, uh, there was a very um, a famous um, women's department in the government called the Jeannot Dell, which dealt with, um, in some cases, um, you know, spreading propaganda, agitation for women, by women, I guess you could say, um, but also played a, a very important role just in, in helping women deal with the everyday issues, navigating um, life in the workspace, making sure that the, uh, the terms of legal equality were met by their bosses, by their co-workers. But in some ways, the existence of the Jeanne Adele served to, uh, served to kind of segregate women's interests from the interests of the party and separate women from the leadership of the party, say. Um, and this was, <clears throat> this is also tied in with kind of traditional patriarchal ideas about women's place um, that, were, that were kind of common in the Communist Party. And also due to the kind of particular Bolshevik um, issue that any kind of agitation or, or struggle um, in this case, for say women's equality, that might detract from or distract from the uh, the struggle against capitalists, against the bourgeoisie, was problematic. Um, so women's issues got pushed to the side, and very much by the party.
So that was, uh, that's, that's kind of the experience of women in the Soviet Union up till Stalin's rule, which is really consolidated around 1929. Um, but Stalin pushed back against a lot of these, a lot of these policies, especially those policies having to do more with, uh, with social freedoms um, or, or social equality rather than uh, economic changes. Some of this was because of the need for stability. If, the, if the, the communists had spent the previous 10 years kind of hacking away at the pillars of uh, old Russian society, at this point, there was a need for stability. There had been so much chaos, so much upheaval over the last uh, decades, really, that Stalin and the other leaders thought there needed to be stability. One of the ways this stability was was entrenched was through a new family code that Stalin drew up in 1936, and it's been called the Great Retreat um, because it's it's a step away from the more radical ideas of Kollontai and to some extent Lenin. This had several main planks. Uh, first of all, divorce was made uh, quite difficult. You now had to have both uh, both parties actually show up at the divorce hearings which means that it was pretty easy to block a divorce that you were against. Uh, previously, uh, previously, if one party didn't show up for a divorce hearing, they were simply notified of the divorce with a postcard. A divorce was also made a lot more expensive. Um, there was, you know, your first divorce cost 50 rubles, which, you know, okay, that's a decent amount, and your second divorce would cost 100. Your third divorce would cost 300, and so on. So. Eventually, you get to the point where you're not going to be the guy getting 15 divorces anymore. It's just not going to happen. Ab abortion became no longer free and openly available. It was um, reserved only for issues dealing with the health or life of the mother. This, to some extent, um, served to just drive a lot of abortions underground although it did also lower the abortion rate so that uh, so the, the birth rate increased somewhat. Uh, tax codes were changed to favor large families, and uh, they, were, they began to be tilted against uh, single people. Mothers with, with six children or more got a really decent cash payment. 2,000 2, rubles per year is a serious amount of money. However, even better than that was the medal for being the mother heroine if you had ten children or more, um, this was this this was not a small thing. This was a you know a, a great honor in the Soviet Union, um, although also pretty hard to achieve. All of these put together did make large changes in the the social trends that had been occurring up to uh, say 1936, but. Divorce rates did decline, but also marriage rates did decline. So you didn't really have a change in the marriage-divorce ratio, um, meaning not much of an increase in the, uh, the number of stable families. You had, um, along with that, uh, the continuation of uh, kind of deadbeat fathers, deadbeat men just running away from their families. Uh, very often uh, the woman was just left with a child or two, and the babushka, the grandmother, um, who kind of was, continued to be the rock of the family. Um, and in terms of economics, Stalin, uh, Stalin's policies continued and even really improved upon a, a fairly decent for the time period in the, the worldwide perspective, um, a fairly decent uh, situation for women, economically speaking. The women were very much actively encouraged to, uh, to be part of Soviet economic development, and uh, by World War II you had uh, women really becoming dominant in certain, uh, certain high-status fields, especially like doctors, uh, very often engineers, industrial workers. You had, this was to some extent, a, well, very much uh, kind of a, a smaller uh, number of women. But even in World War II, there were, there were many women who played combat roles, which was, um, I guess, had been foreshadowed by the Women's Death Battalion in World War I. 
um, but continued on in the Second War. There was still uh, what you could call a glass ceiling in terms of very high posts in government or in other areas for women. Um, there, you don't see a lot of women in, um, in say, the Politburo, uh, but at the same time, this compared to other countries of the time period, Russia was, uh, the Soviet Union was, was doing really quite well. And finally, despite, this is kind of like a double whammy in a lot of ways for women, um, but progress in terms of, of economic independence and of being able to develop a career is quite good, um, meaning that women now have to spend a lot more time, energy, um, in towards their careers, but no, nothing is being pushed onto the men from the other side in terms of in terms of what needs to happen around the house, looking after children, cooking, housework, that kind of thing. There's there's a continued patriarchal society that does view that as women's work despite the advancement of women in uh, more professional spheres. So eh, it's kind of one step forward, one step back for women as a whole during this time period. I think that's all I've got to say right now. So think about this and go watch the video about the night witches.